most powerful entities that aren't Autobots or Decepticons. Over the course of their adventures and horrifically destructive civil war, the Transformers have come across all kinds of weird and wonderful aliens, mercenaries, traitor bots, and extra dimensional entities. And some of them are pretty damn powerful. So make yourself comfortable, hit like on the video, and let's get started with a bot that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about here. And that's Double Dealer. Now we do have a video about bots that switch sides coming up at some point, but this guy definitely deserves a mention on this list too, because the bot formerly known as Dealer has been both an Autobot and a Decepticon. The IDW storyline was a great example of this, where Hot Rod's first mission in command ended with Hot Rod having to flee and abandon his men, one of them being Dealer. Hot Rod then went to great lengths to rescue Dealer because he felt so bad about it, but it turned out that the mission went wrong in the first place because Dealer done a backstab and sabotaged the team's equipment and set them up to be ambushed. In War for Cybertron Earthrise, he had his own faction and infiltrated the Ark in an attempt to bring the Autobots in on behalf of the Quintessons, before falling out with them and turning against the Quintessons before his ship, the Fool's Fortune, exploded in a firefight. <laughs> You know what, let's see if we can rank some of these. And the weakest one that I can think of would probably be... Yes, these lizard pig things are about half the size of a transformer and travel around the cosmos in their flying asteroid, hiring out their incompetence and ineptitude to anyone stupid enough to pay for it. The Quintessons hired this guy to blow up the Galactic Olympic Games. Galvatron paid him to fail at bringing in the traitor Octane. This guy who would just randomly fall over. Well, who knows what he was doing here? Yeah, that's better. What's when he finally did catch up with Octane, he tried to kill him by beating him in the shoulder and then squealed like a piggy. For some reason, Galvatron hired him again to sabotage Cybertron's shiny new power generator. And he did, but Grimlock just fixed it. Yes, class. Anyway, he returned again in a script reading at a convention where he bought a trans-dimensional transporter off the internet and used it to bring a bunch of different characters from the Transformers multiverse together and force them to fight to the death to get revenge for all of the humiliations he's been forced to endure. And guess what? He failed and got humiliated there too. Pathetic, pathetic, pathetic. Let's move on. Another absolutely useless one was Bot from G1 or B-O-T that was built as a science project. These kids saw the Transformers in action one day and tried to build one of their own, but inadvertently installed one of Bruticus's components that had ended up in a junkyard. So after they slung it all together, the shitbox instantly went bananas and broke through the fucking wall to escape, and the Autobots spent most of the episode trying to track it down. It eventually ended up helping in a battle with the Decepticons, but the most surprising thing was that this walking croc of sunbaked turd burger actually gave the Autobots a tougher time than the Skuxoid ever did. Next. <laughs> Let's head over to Planet Femax, where a race of giant women rule over a barbaric and stupid male population. They live inside this lovely mountain in a place called the Golden Realm, where they don't have to bother about disgusting loincloth-wearing savages who prowl the wastelands outside. So the queen of these big bitches was called The First One, and was on the search for a male counterpart who could, you know, sort of match her so he could become her second. Yes, I want an equal who I can be infinitely better than! What? SILENCE EQUAL! And guess what? In walks Cloudburst, and she's like, ooh, hello! Cloudburst obviously being a pretender and looking like an organic. So she's like, ooh, hello! So she puts all her moves on him and ultimately is pretty disappointed to find out that he's got a drive shaft where his meat shaft should be. So she cuts his fucking head off. There were the TV-obsessed Junkions from the planet of the same name. Their origin is unclear, but it's most likely that they're an offshoot of Cybertronian lineage. They aren't the most powerful by a long stretch, but they are very difficult to kill, having a very high tolerance to damage and the skills to make quick repairs to themselves using the vast amount of junk around them. Quick mention goes to the cannibalizers, who are beings that live in the junkyards of Cybertron. They seem to find and add to their bodies, taking body parts from any victims that stray onto their turf. They're not massively smart, they're not particularly strong, at least not to your average Transformers, but when a team of G.I. Joes got teleported to Cybertron, these things posed some serious risk, especially this one that had somehow got hold of Shockwave's arm cannon. So in order to protect their squishy humi friends, the Autobots decided to make a hasty getaway. Transformers Animated had the Colossus, or Cyrus Rhodes, this little old man who took part in a wrestling match and turned himself into this Giga Chad beefcake to showcase the superiority of biotech. He beat the crap out of Bumblebee before a nearby car alarm disorientated him. And long story short, this led to an accident that turned Prometheus Black 
into Meltdown, a supervillain that was able to secrete an acidic metal that could melt anything it comes into contact with. Luckily, not force fields though, and the Autobots trapped him inside a bubble, and all was well in the world again. Animated also had Master Disaster and a couple others, but you know, I'm not gonna spend too much time on them. Like, come on, this video's long enough as it is. Time to talk about a species that strikes fear into not only the Cybertronians, but also all mechanical lifeforms in the galaxy. We all remember that episode in Transformers Prime where they, where they were accidentally set free from a large container in the Arctic, but they were first introduced in the Marvel comic, where they ended up on Earth because this guy flew through a space cloud of nuts and bolts. Yeah, they transformed into nuts and bolts, yeah. Anyway, he crash landed on Earth, bringing the millions of tiny little microscopic problems with him before his head fell off. So these things would either transform into a nut or a bolt and then burrow into a Transformer's skin. Luckily, turns out they didn't like water. All this guy slaps and high high kicks. These scraplets even combined to form whatever the fuck this is before the Decepticons managed to bring it down. Sploosh. In Regeneration 1, Megatron injected Cup with the scraplet virus, and this was only the first time that we'd see them shrunken down to microscopic levels. In Transformers 84, Shockwave did the exact same thing to incapacitate the Coneheads, and in IDW's 2005 continuity, Prowl suggested executing Megatron by giving him a single scraplet to swallow, which would then slowly eat him alive, I presume. Prowl, you horrible. In Cyberverse, Starscream claimed that his scraplets were the reborn sparks of Cybertronian legends, such as Zeta Prime, Solus Prime, and Megatronus, but I think he was tripping balls at the time. So although the scraplets were really, really small, they are hugely destructive, and in large enough numbers, they can take down who knows, even titans maybe. Another gremlin-like critter from G1 is the Crimzeek, a little flame-shaped bugger that was created by Megatron and Starscream by accident. And as soon as the cons saw how annoying it was, they realized they could unleash it on the Autobots. Yes, Crimzeek, you will be my ultimate weapon against the Autobots. <laughs> really? It's actually an energy being that, that can not only travel through circuitry, but also fry robo circuits, as we saw here where it jumped into Mirage's face and caused him to have have a spasm. This guy figured out that he could spray the Autobots with an insulating paint, so the Crimzeek couldn't get into their systems. Anyway, at that point it ran amok throughout Tokyo, somehow making this bullet train go all wobbly like rubber, before all the Crimzeeks of the rainbow appeared and all merged together and grew to ridiculous proportions, even showing up to a cinema showing a kaiju movie, which I thought was pretty funny. That's its tail, right? They eventually found a way to disperse its energy with magnets or something, who knows? But it turned out that annoyingly, a little one had survived in Blaster's chest. Anyway, these things would pop up once in a while throughout the continuities. I recently came across one in Transformers Devastation where you had to collect them. But they were also in Transformers G.I. Joe where the entity Crimzeek would devour the souls of any Transformer that didn't make it to the AllSpark quickly enough. There was also a version in the Transformers Ghostbusters crossover where he was known as Crimzeek the Scavenger. And he was a mixture of electrical and psychokinetic energies on a quest to consume the AllSpark. Long story short, the Autobots had to team up with the Ghostbusters and Ectotron, and the Ghostbusters released this ghost called Kilowatt that fed on electrical energy. So these guys are very similar to the Scraplets in that they're essentially just gremlins, but the fact that the larger version of Kremzeek can travel across the stars, absorbed Starscream, Shockwave, and Megatron, and the fact that it took another highly powerful entity to take him down made me place these guys a little higher than the Scraplets. Then there's the Mechanibals. Led by Mastermouth, these spidery, robot-eating mechanical lifeforms whose head are basically just a razor blade smile with a couple of eyes on top, these guys will often not eat all of their prey, but only certain parts, regurgitating what they don't want and then selling whatever's left on the black market. So they're clearly not animalistic in the way that, say, the, the Scraplets from Prime are, having some kind of societal hierarchy and some kind of economy. They fly around in a ship like Space Pirates, which is equipped with magnets that can draw any unsuspecting Transformer in like a tractor beam. These things are pretty tough too. It it wasn't until the combined form of the Wreckers, called Wreckage, managed to crush one in of Masters and Mayhem that they ran back to their hive, and this was the first known instance of a Cybertronian managing to kill one. Although Grimlock seemed to do it really easily in King Grimlock, but we'll talk more about that later. So leeches, who doesn't love leeches? Like honestly, how did Mother Nature come up with a fucking vampire slug that swims around waiting for some poor asshole to wander by so they can go nom nom nom, let me just get a good latch right here, nom 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 nom. Anyway, the Cyber Wraith 
is a kind of a giant one floating around in space. These are parasitic life forms that inhabit the malevolent dead universe. Not only are they capable of growing to an enormous size, they've also been known to be cannibalistic, even eating their own young. But most dangerous to Cybertronians, they can phase through a Transformer's body to reach and feed on their spark. So anyway, when the Autobots had to venture into the dead universe, Brainstorm analyzed the dead body of a young Cyber Wraith and came up with a way to use its venom to create a force field that would camouflage the Autobots and make the evil dimension and everything in it think that they were native life forms. Didn't seem to work too good though, as a bunch of adult Cyber Wraiths came, came along and tried to eat them. Interestingly enough, they were scared off by Cyclonus, who in this continuity was a former resident of the dead universe. Oh, you're from here too, run! Okay, we gotta talk about Buridanka. No. Yes, it's a giant carnivorous plant. <laughs> so this one was one of Scorponok's evil schemes in the Japanese Headmasters, where he tried to destroy Arch Rifle Fortress Maximus and the Autobot Headmasters by planting seeds under this building where it grew to an enormous size, poking out of the building's roof. It eventually uprooted itself and became mobile, where he wrapped up Maximus's spaceship to so Fort Max. Master Sword! Use the power of the Master Sword to destroy it. Oh. Earns its place on the list because it took one of the most powerful Autobots ever to bring it down. Oh. Grimlock took on a load of weird and wonderful creatures in King Grimlock, where he was transported to this kind of fantasy Dungeons and Dragons planet and had to go up against Woodbots an undead army, a whole bunch of Smilodons, and the dreaded Red Wizard. Yes, the Red Wizard, who turned out to be none other than a Quintesson. This whole storyline was inspired by an episode of G1, where Spike and Grimlock inadvertently stumbled into this fantasy world full of these trees that transform into these centaur things. Am I tripping balls here? And yeah, the Red Wizard turns out to be this Quintesson who was exiled for practicing sorcery. Anyway, if you've ever wanted to see Grimlock face off against a dragon, then this is the one for you. Then there's the Chaos Taros, a beast that bit off and shat out Wheelie's arm after he crash landed on planet LV-117. Wheelie managed to domesticate it though and used it in a battle against Monstructor. Obviously Monstructor was just too strong for it and killed it off as well as an Arachnosaur, which is kind of like this giant spider that Wheelie had also managed to domesticate. Now I don't know if this is related or not, but Gen 1 had this creature called Chaos. Chaos, Chaos Taros, Chaos, Chaos Taros, see what I mean? And this thing was the source of the dreaded and feared Death Crystals. It all begins with Cup telling the story about how 100,000 years ago he was captured by slavers and forced to work in the crystal mines, searching for these crystals that were apparently the strongest element to have ever been discovered. So the Autobots and the Decepticons start squabbling over these with, with Megatron, of course, wanting to make a huge Death Crystal cannon. Turns out these things grow on this thing's skin. And I feel bad for this guy, like he never did anything wrong, but he ended up being persecuted for his skin and then obliterated when the Autobots blasted him with the Death Crystal Cannon, as its own crystals were the only thing that could actually hurt it. And I know, I know, Gen 1's pretty goofy like that, you know? But let's say for a second that these crystals are really that tough, and this thing is covered in them. He's already pretty big, like he's probably about as big as a combiner, wouldn't you say? So you throw all that together in the mixer and yeah, you can see why the Cybertronians are kind of fearful of him. Notable mention goes to Circuit Breaker, who was this genius superhero called Josie Bella, who was paralyzed by the Decepticons, but invented herself a pretty revealing outfit that allowed her to walk again, but also shoot beams of electricity and shut down machinery from a distance. Like here she probably fried Starscream. The story was later kind of reworked in Regeneration 1, where an older and angrier version of Spike Witwicky became Circuit Smasher, who used his powers in the fight against an evil supercomputer called Auntie and all her guardians. Auntie was basically the Ark supercomputer, but she went mad when she was reprogrammed by Megatron, but that's another story. Quite a few superheroes in the Transformers comics, especially the Marvel ones, and I can't hope to cover them all. I just figured that Spike Witwicky was a little bit more relevant than the others because, you know, he's one of the Transformers family, isn't he? Let's talk about rust. Although it most often just gives Cybertronians like a nasty rash, it's a substance that can sometimes be lethal to them. It's one that we've seen weaponized, and it's even turned into a plague and killed off vast numbers of bots, even occasionally turning them into rust zombies. But Norm, rust isn't an entity, I hear you say. What's it doing in this video? Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Well, first off, we have the rust giants that Rodimus and his crew encountered whilst on one of their adventures in the Lost Light. 
Then there's the rust sea, which was formed by the secretions of rust worms. Yes, they're poopy. No one quite knows where this aggressive ravenous species came from, but it began feasting on the metallic innards of planet Cybertron and pooping out liquid rust. Enough poopy to create an entire sea. Eventually, the greatest minds on the planet started to get worried that they wouldn't be able to contain the worms and that they'd eventually overrun the whole planet. But the problem kind of took care of itself as they carved out a huge basin for themselves, which was lined by this impenetrable sort of um, rock lining, as I understand it. And that kept them penned in. Anything that happens to fall into the sea will get devoured, though, as unfortunate Decepticon Skytread found out here. Oh, yep, yeah, they're eating his face. And as one of the largest titans called Citadel found out the hard way when he had to crash land in there. So whilst not that powerful on an individual basis, their sheer numbers are terrifying. If they were to ever spill out of this basin, the Cybertronians have a big, big problem on their hands. Another parasitic life form, this time native to the planet Marasma. They infect their host before feeding on their charisma. They use the corpse of Autobot Countdown as an incubator for their young before growing into these xenomorph-like horn beasts. They ripped a bot called Sky Striker in half before the crew of the Lost Light realized that they could be overdosed on charisma. So when Megatron and Rodimus showed up, these things just couldn't handle all that combined swagger and all the ticks died. All right, time to get serious. Time to talk about lockdown. <laughs> Traveling around the galaxy hunting the rogue knights on behalf of the mysterious creators, the Bayverse Lockdown saw himself above the Civil War. He traveled from planet to planet, crossing names off his list and imprisoning them in his ship that had apparently once belonged to the Knights themselves. By the time of the events of Age of Extinction, he had managed to capture all but one of his targets, namely Optimus Prime. Although he hated humans, he would occasionally make them his allies, trading tech and power in return for their allegiance. For example, he promised this guy a seed a device that explodes with the force of a tactical nuke and uses Transformium to cyberform large areas. And he did this in return for intel and local knowledge on the whereabouts of Prime. He would call upon his robotic wolf pack called Steel Jaws to hunt and kill anyone stupid enough to flee. And his ship had this hugely powerful magnetic weapon that could lift up anything metallic in the radius. And none of this is to mention the fact that this dude has a railgun that comes out of his face. He mercilessly ripped out Ratchet's spark. He impaled Optimus on his own sword. And apparently that scar on his face, well, rumor has it that he got that in a clash with Megatron. Anyway, the Titan movie comics explored his backstory, as at one stage he was a Decepticon through and through, but with this little bounty hunter side hustle for a bit of extra gravy. One time he was out on a mission with Knucklehead and Drift, and he wanted to bomb an Autobot base. Then he tried to execute the prisoners against his orders. He fell out with former partner Drift and took control of the remaining Decepticons after Megatron was killed in the Battle of Chicago. Then he left Earth to hunt some more bounty before eventually being pulled out of the fray by the creators. These mysterious beings that apparently created the Transformers in this area of space called the Tyran Universal Cluster, their reasons for wanting their knights returned to them or killed is unknown, which is annoying because it's something that Lockdown could have probably shed some light on before, well. Then there's Serpentor, who was meant to be the US military's ultimate weapon. Created by blending the DNA of history's greatest warriors, he was engineered by a splinter branch of the US military who went rogue and used a bunch of Decepticon tech to build an asset that not only had all of the knowledge and experience of humanity's greatest warriors, but also the ability to control machinery using these mechanical tentacles. Of course, he rebelled, mishmash moosh, went to Cybertron to recruit Predaking and Piranacon, plus the Stunticons. He crushed Bumblebee before ripping the matrix of leadership out of Optimus's chest, which turned him into Serpentor Prime. An unforeseen consequence of this, though, was that the matrix gave him a conscience, and he almost instantly started feeling bad for all the bad shit he'd done. He even tried to kill himself. Cobra took control of him before he could, and of course, you know, much monologuing and rampaging and supervillain stuff ensued. So to recap, he offered Bumblebee will be a taste of the true death. He ripped open Optimus. He threatened to crush RC to death and generally just, you know, take over the world. General, general supervillain, you know. Let's talk about an alien species originating from a nebula so dark and dense that not even light can penetrate it. The shape-shifting and parasitic diorates 
use this place as their base to spread like a plague across all of existence and infecting and infiltrating every society they come across. Using powerful dark magic, they conceive themselves in the bodies of other living organisms, transforming their prey into horrific mutations and assimilating them into their horde. There are few creatures that can resist, and they reportedly infiltrated Earth many, many years ago. They live in these sort of hives and are of course insanely strong and durable with, with thick plated hides, some of them have wings, and they all have these multiple limbs that can extend into sort of tentacles. Like check this out, they brought Ultra Magnus down at one point by having a bunch climb on his back, then using these extendable limbs as anchors to pull him down. More on that later. It's believed that they were somehow created many millennia ago in the fallout of the Cybertronians' war against the Antillans, when the scientist known simply as the Antillan used his doomsday device called the Talisman to destroy his own planet. And because the device was so powerful, it unleashed chaos energies and radiation across space-time, even as far as planet Prismos, where it corrupted the planet's natural magic energies, which created the very first diorates. They migrated to a remote dark nebula, where they began colonizing the galaxy eventually coming into contact with the Solstar Order, who formed the Space Knights to try and keep the spread under control. It escalated into a large-scale war that escalated to the point that the Knights destroyed the Wraith's homeworld, which was a huge blow to their society, but scattered the survivors throughout the galaxy, where they then targeted small, lightly populated worlds to rebuild their empire. It was at this point that this guy, Vectral, came to prominence. Once they encountered the Cybertronians, he saw that a fusion of their magic with Cybertronian tech could be a devastating combination, so he struck up an alliance with Starscream, an equally treacherous and cruel character. Like he demonstrated here when he picks up a native villager and then just tosses him over his shoulder, and later then you see his wife or whatever over the crumpled body like, Jesus Christ, Starscream. The Diorate's first attempt to assimilate a Cybertronian resulted in Decepticon Skyblast being contorted into an uncontrollable mess in a constant state of extreme agony. He instantly went crazy, grabbed another Decepticon called Doomwings, and ripped him in half before going on an insane rampage, killing many innocents, much to Vectral's delight, before he reached critical mass and started to break down, exploding violently and eventually burning away to nothing. Vectral was like, oh, well, no, well, that didn't work. Let's try again. Any volunteers? Funnily enough, <laughs> there weren't any. Anyway, Vectral was eventually killed when the Energon synthesizer Starscream had been after exploded, destroying half the planet. But apparently, a slither of him survived on Stardrive's body. I really like Stardrive, actually. I'm going to do a video on female bots at some point, and I'll talk about her more then. Anyway, after this whole thing, the Diorates had a little meeting, and they deemed Vectral's experiments to be fucked up. Well, disastrous abominations if you want to use their terminology. And they agreed never to conduct any such experiments ever again, going back to using magic instead. Anyway, Star Drive left the Space Knights and went off into exile where she slowly mutated into the first ever stable Cybertronian slash Diorate hybrid who could even use their magical abilities. Then began the Diorate operation to take over Earth assimilating and replacing government authorities with Wraith copies. They were interested in Earth mainly because of its vast supply of Ore 13, and as such, they made a deal with Cobra, who would give them valuable Ore 13 in return for them helping attain Dominion of Earth. And long story short, the Autobots, Mask, G.I. Joes, all had to come together to stop them. And after that, a number of Wraiths settled on Earth and made it their new home, even defending it when Unicron showed up to wreck the place. Now, before the Quintessence created the Transformers in G1, they apparently created the Trans Organics, these beast beings that were supposedly too violent and uncontrollable for anything other than just being unleashed for destruction. And what in Zeus's butthole is that? Look, it's like a bear trap with lizard legs and a fucking, what's it like? Most of them were destroyed eons ago, but some were so powerful that they couldn't be destroyed, so were put in into suspended hibernation, until Galvatron blundered in and set them loose, of course. Galvatron is just mental, isn't he? Let me know if you want to see a video on him. And again, G1 animation and voice acting and stuff made these seem kind of goofy, but as I said in the logic of the show, they were meant to be pretty buff. We haven't had many entries from the Beast era yet, have we? Well, how about Rampage? So it turns out that Rampage was one of the original reasons that the Maximal ship Axelon was in space in the first place, when it was diverted to chase down Megatron's ship. Basically, after he was created by Deluge, who was trying to recreate Starscream's immortal spark, he was deemed to be too dangerous and sent to be marooned on a barren space rock somewhere. This was after the being known as Protoform X went on a murderous frenzy, earning him the name Rampage. 
Rampage literally feeds on the pain and suffering he causes. And he was forced to join the Predacons against his will and basically hates the rest of his team, typically being bored and uncooperative on his missions that he's given, often sneaking off for his own purposes to try to relieve his boredom in the most cruel and horrible ways possible. Next, I wanted to talk about the Reapers. <laughs> this roving gang of living weapons who think they can bring peace to the galaxy by eradicating all violent races. Like, by force. Like, by using violence, basically. Like, it's really only a matter of time before they realise that they're going to have to eradicate themselves, eventually. I'll probably touch on them again when I come to do Transformers Factions Ranked, but boiling it down, they were led by a guy called the Deathbringer, and they hunted down violent races before exterminating them and their penchant and talent for destruction alienated them from everyone but each other. Now, as powerful as these guys were, the Deathbringer would only get more powerful as Galvatron infected him with the essence of unlife itself, turning him into a harbinger of death and doom who could spread death and decay just by touch. Again, more detail on them in a future vid. Let's talk about the Shadow Leeches, no, 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 no. which are kind of entwined with the Dark Matrix entity. So in certain continuities, the Matrix was corrupted by holders that were slightly less pure and righteous than what we've come to know in our Guy Optimus. And yes, if you Google Robo Jesus, like I just did, you will find people who have made transforming crucifixes. And the Matrix developed a malevolent sentience dedicated to the proliferation of evil and suffering in the universe. Anyway, in the Marvel Universe, this thing was created when Optimus died. The Autobots didn't seem to realize that the Matrix could be removed. It can be removed. And they blasted his casket off into space. <laughs> the casket crash landed on a remote moon where the Matrix was found by a Deathbringer. Bum, bum, bum. The Deathbringer is this dark being that releases any being from suffering and kills them, basically. But it's usually a mercy killing type thing. But once it found and absorbed the Matrix, it, its logic warped and it suddenly wanted to bring death to all life. I want to bring death to all life. The Deathbringer was killed, but the Matrix itself had been corrupted and became sentient. The creature reappeared in Dreamwave's Regeneration 1, where it manipulated Hot Rod into taking the Matrix and becoming Rodimus again, before using his Shadow Leeches, which are basically possessed Transformers who can drain energy out of any life form they touch, and absorb it into themselves. These things were pretty much unstoppable and almost took over the entire population of Cybertron at one point. Sometimes called Cybervores, sometimes called Soul Snatchers, and apparently 998 other things as well, because sometimes they're even called the Nightmare of a Thousand Names. Let's just call them Spark Eaters. <laughs> Little is known of the mysterious Spark Eaters. So little, in fact, that most Cybertronians think of them as simply a myth or a legend. A tale so feared that the mere mention of them can invoke a sense of supernatural terror even among battled hardened warriors. There's a well-known poem about them that goes, Nickel, iron, cobalt, chrome. He'll eat your soul, turn your spark to stone. Nickel, iron, cobalt, chrome. Run, little robot. Run away home. Now, although not much is known about these creatures, we do know that their creation was probably down to one of these weird time paradoxes where scientists brainstorm, inspired by the myth of the Spark Eaters, invented a weapon that could turn a Transformer into this monstrosity. I guess when you're inventing a constant stream of killing devices, you've got to spice it up for yourself somehow. Like one could turn bots into rainbow vomit, one could turn, you know, I don't know. You, you need inspiration from somewhere. But then Whirl took the weapon and ended up going back in time. And there he used it on a bot in the past, creating an event that would in effect give rise to the legend, which would then inspire Brainstorm to create his weapon. I love time paradoxes. My favorite is still Fry becoming his own grandfather though. On another occasion, Cyclonus used the weapon on a security card who had a bunch of turbo foxes with him. They locked that guard in a room as they saw the mutation setting in and the creature fed upon the turbo foxes, managing to sustain itself for years. You see, once it's consumed a spark, it will stay in its belly for an untold amount of time, slowly being digested. This creature would eventually escape, making an Autobot called Shock its first victim. It was here that we saw that as well as having razor sharp claws for incapacitating and these chain like tendrils for immobilizing, it also has near supernatural powers of telekinesis that it used to pull Shock's brain out through his mouth, which would then paralyze him, rendering him unable to move as it then ripped out his spark to devour. This thing can smell sparks and will generally go after the strongest or brightest spark and hunt it down. This creature went after Rung because as you know, he turned out to be Primus with amnesia. But on the way, this creature came across Animus, who became its next victim. 
It later turned out that Animus had a green spark, so he was one of the ultra rare 0.1 percenters like Sixshot or Tarn, which is probably why the Spark Eater went after him. Anyway, when Whirl fired a bunch of rockets at the creature, Trailbreaker saw that the spark still being digested in its belly would explode, so he shielded it with his force field to prevent damage to their ship. This thing was finally killed when Rodimus used Rung as bait to lure it into the ship's engine bays and pushed it into a quantum generator, which fused it into an engine block and finally killed it. As I mentioned in my last vid, Getaway turned his crew over to the Grand Architect as a gesture of his allegiance, and Scorponok somehow turned a lot of them into spark eaters. Now, how he did that without Brainstorm's weapon isn't exactly known, but writer James Roberts did confirm that there is at least one other method for creating spark eaters, but he didn't elaborate on what that was. Anyway, those creatures would later set upon Rodimus's crew, but luckily Autobot First Aid managed to fire a powerful kinetic blast that somehow reversed the mutation. Next up, the scheming and treacherous Quintessons. Now, for years I thought of these guys as the sole creators of the Transformers, you know, before they came up with the Primus and Unicron origin story, or the Ore Spark, or the 13 Primes, or any of that stuff, there was even one storyline where the Quintessons conquered Cybertron after the Transformers had been created by Primus. But even if they aren't thought of as the creators, they are still one of the weirdest and most fascinating races in the franchise. Needless to say, they have multiple faces, and they operate these bizarre courts with judges, bailiffs, executioners, prosecutors, with which they would keep discipline throughout their empire. They originally created the Autobots as slave labor and the Decepticons for military duties, but of course their cruelty came back to bite them in the ass as the robots rebelled and overthrew them. What intrigues me though, is the thought that they must have had a huge empire at some point. They ran Cybertron and had the resources to come up with an entire race, not to mention their home planet Quintessa, and all of their scheming quite often shows that their roots run deep throughout the galaxy. So it's on the basis of the size of their empire that I'm giving them this place on the list more than anything else. Because let's face it, as individuals, they're not all that powerful. The one exception could be the Bayverse Quintessa. Now we don't know if she's a Quintessan or not, as she's widely known as the Great Deceiver in that universe. But even if she isn't, she hella powerful. Lightning powers, telekinesis, the ability to corrupt and mind control other bots, and with her staff, drain the life force of entire planets. One character that I absolutely love is Rom, whose family was killed when Diorath sent deadly asteroids to his home planet. So he joined the Space Knights of the Soul Star Order and was given this crazy suit of armor with enough firepower to put a dent in the world. As I said before, the Soul Star Order had this kind of rocky relationship with the Cybertronians, but they did team up several times in IDW's continuity and of course helped out in the final battle against Unicron. Round about here, if anyone's still watching that is, you'd probably be wondering why I haven't mentioned the Primes. And you'd be right because technically they're not either Autobots or Decepticons. Although apart from the Fallen, they do seem to be mostly good. But you know what? I'm going to do a video at least trying to rank the Primes in terms of power. So I'm going to keep most of my chatter for that. So now we're at the God level, the top tier. Let's start with Cthulhu. One of HP Lovecraft's great old ones, lying in his death-like slumber in the great depths of the Pacific Ocean. When the stars are right, this ancient god rises to mold humans' dreams and nightmares, and the mere sight of him is enough to send a person mad. He appeared in the IDW special Infestation, where Optimus goes head to head with Cthulhu, and actually makes pretty short work of him. Which is a shame, I find if this had been handled a little more seriously, Cthulhu would have possibly Particularly because I'm pretty sure that the Matrix wouldn't have worked on the Elder God in the same way that it worked on Unicron. So God knows how they would have beaten it. But no, all that happens in the comic is that Optimus dives into the ocean and gets choppy. Shame, real shame. What about an entity known as the Threefold Spark, or Exarchon, a figure from the 2019 IDW continuity. Now I've spoken about this guy before, who started out as a pretty regular Cybertronian before he left Cybertron in the age of expansion. Something happened and he returned hell bent on conquest and domination and the usual super villain traits. The explanation given was that unknown cosmic entities who live behind the barrier of quintessence abducted him and altered his spark into something that we would liken to a virus, which could infect and take over another Cybertronian body, absorbing and consuming their sparks and minds in the process. 
but luckily he couldn't just spread like a plague and was limited to three bodies at a time. So he ended up jumping from body to body in a quest that involved him trying to fulfill a vision he once had of him ruling over Cybertron in the name of these mysterious entities, whoever they were. And he would do this by infecting the AllSpark itself with his evil essence. And guess how he would do that? Yep, by allying himself with our favorite dude, Shockwave. Together, they tried to clone an army, and that's how they created Sound Blaster. They tried to clone Skywarp, but they couldn't get the clones to teleport like the original could. At one point, Jumpstream, who could teleport, accidentally jumped into an alternate future where Exarchon had stolen the bodies of Megatron, Shockwave, and Onslaught, and used the fearsome trio to conquer all of Cybertron. And after that, he drained Cybertron's Energon and put the Transformers into slavery. Now the capabilities of his powers of possession seem to vary. It was told that he once took control of a titan called Croaton, and the poor big guy had to be put out of action by another titan called Citadel. More on those in my most powerful titans bit. So yeah, he's been known to control titans, but on another occasion he tried to take control of Devastator. But because there are six minds at play within Devastator, he was able to resist and just decombined as a result. So you wonder, don't you, could, like who could he take over? If he could take over Megatron and a titan, could he take over Unicron? We'll never know. Round about here, we should probably mention the Vok, a highly evolved race of energy beings who reach the pinnacle of technological sophistication to the point where they seemingly transcend space and time. Featuring in the Beast Wars saga, they find primitive worlds like Earth and use them for their strange experiments that seemingly aim to accelerate the development of sapient life. And when it all goes pear-shaped, just cleanse the planet with gigantic super weapons like boom. All right, so I know I said I wouldn't talk about the primes, but I think we should probably make an exception for this guy. Let's take a minute to talk about a force of infinite evil one that can't ever truly be defeated. I'm talking about Liege Maximo. So a lot of this isn't exactly canon, as it was written by Simon Furman in a kind of unofficial novel called Alignment. You see, he first appeared in Gen 2 on only one single page. So Simon Furman wrote Alignment to give us some more information on what was a hugely intriguing character. He is described as an ancient and monumental titan and the first to turn against Primus. In this continuity, he was one of the original 13 primes, but didn't multiply in the way that the others did. Whereas the other primes wanted to seed the universe with as much life as possible, this guy was much more selective, seeding only a few bots who would spread his evil before eventually becoming the Decepticons. Realizing that this way he could keep a stronger connection to the divine source of the Transformers race, he set about creating a vast array of cyberform planets, an array that would resonate and create a portal that would allow him to ascend to the realm of the gods. He was only defeated when an alliance of Autobots and Decepticons attacked the hub and managed to destroy his physical body as he was separated from it whilst using the portal. And that left his spirit with nowhere to go. But as I said, this guy can never truly be destroyed. So I guess he's still floating out there somewhere. There was another incarnation of the character too in IDW's 2005 continuity, who allied himself with Onyx Prime, who was of course Shockwave in disguise. He became one of the 13 Primes before being banished for his part in the murder of Solus Prime. But I'll talk about him more in my video on the Primes. Most people will probably put my next entry as the most powerful, but there's a very simple reason why I didn't, and let me explain. Now, I did a couple of decent videos on this guy already, one talking about his origins, one talking about his abilities. So I won't go over everything again, but essentially, planet-sized destructive force of nature that won't rest until everything is darkness again. He's destroyed countless planets, wiped out many civilizations, and he's even consumed and contained a black hole, the most destructive force in the universe within his body. I can barely contain a mild curry. But to accomplish his goal, he has to clear one very large hurdle, and that's kill his brother Primus and the pesky little robots that he created. Something that he's never actually managed to do. So let's talk about Primus, a being who is as old as the universe, a life force that crosses the multiverse and that can exist in different universes at the same time. He's the creator of the Transformers and overall a force of light and good in the darkness. Apart from that one time in Shadow of Glass, that is. He's also often portrayed as a face in a fucking wall. There are several different variants of the Transformers origin story, but the one that seems to stick is that Unicron and Primus are brothers, opposing forces of light and dark created by an extra dimensional entity called the One in order to represent the opposing forces of good and evil. Primus eventually managed to trap Unicron and himself actually in two planetoids. These would gradually develop over the eons into Cybertron, 
and the planet form of Unicron that we all know. It seemed to me that Unicron is actually the more powerful of the two, and that this move to trap Unicron, which, which used Primus's multi-dimensional abilities, was kind of a measure of last resort. We have, however, seen that Primus's essence has saved the day multiple times over the years, most notably when Rodimus opened the Matrix, which is actually only a small sample of Primus's life force, and it ripped Unicron apart from the inside. That's why I've put Primus higher on the list, but let me know what you think. This one is an interesting one, and one that I hesitated to put at the top of this list, because most people would be expecting Unicron, and that might be fair enough. So in some continuities, the dead universe is just sort of a buffer zone, like an empty space between the realms. But in other continuities, it's a place of malevolence and bitterness that was seeded when, guess who? Yep, Shockwave went back in time to the birth of this universe and leached out all of the life force within it to fuel his nefarious scheme. This produced a whole entire universe full of nothingness and unlife and the bitterness of what could have been. They say that to enter it is to die yourself and its only real resident is an entity known as the D-Void, which is an extension of the dead universe itself. Its sole purpose is to breach into the realms of the living, and when it does, this thing is a cosmic horror that appears to our puny human eyes as a writhing mass of black eyeballs, which form tentacles that wriggle in search of life to extinguish as it seeks to suffocate entire worlds in its darkness. It is described as being an unbelievably powerful being with a capacity to return the spark to a deceased transformer, control the minds of robotic beings, and drain energy from Cybertronians to feed on them. Its first manifestation occurred when a mysterious black lake appeared on the planet Gorlam Prime. The inhabitants started being drawn to it, almost as if it called to them somehow, with every last member of the populace walking into the lake, never to walk out. The lake used the power of the robotic population's sparks to ignite the next phase of its plan to further breach into the realm of the living and formed a bizarre sphere that served as a portal a conduit between the land of the living and that of the dead, through which it could pour more of its malevolence, with its next target being Cybertron. The entity possessed Nova Prime, turning him into Nemesis Prime, and would eventually take control of the Decepticons and form an enormous avatar for itself called the Decepticod that would devastate large parts of the planet until it was eventually stopped by Megatron and Optimus dived into Vector Sigma to amplify the power of the Matrix and push the entity back, defeating it. Defeating it for now. Now, I'm not entirely sure that the comics did this entity justice, but the reason I put it at the top of the list was that the most terrifying things to me are often the ones that you don't quite understand, and the thought of an entire universe lying out there in wait, somehow angry at being denied the chance of life, is pretty damn unsettling. All right, you guys, let's leave that there for now. I know there's way, way more creatures and characters to talk about, so please feel free to get in the comments and let me know, and I might do a part two. This month, I'm gonna be working on top Transformers kills, most powerful primes, most powerful titans. I might do the Starscream spotlight video, and I might even start making some notes for another Shockwave video. So make sure you're subscribed for all of that. Thank you very much for all the time that you guys put into watching my videos. I really do appreciate it, and I, We'll see you very soon for the next one. Thanks again for watching and cheerio, bye.